going to take this conversation uh, in another direction. We've been talking about police. We've been talking about police abuse. Uh, we've been talking about Black Lives Matter and what that means. Um, and I've, I've been having a great deal of conversation around um, the organization of Black Lives Matter and the philosophy of Black Lives Matter um, and how those two have become rather convoluted. And um, I, I would even say um, um, co-opted um, um, by the Black Lives Matter organization that has some, some um, belief systems and tenets of their uh, approach that are very broad, so much broader than just, you know, we care about our black youth, we care about our black men and women. It is that, but there's so much included in that, that it has, it has become, uh, it's become something more than uh, just trying to help our society understand, you know, that black men and women, boys and girls are being uh, killed in the streets and oftentimes at the hand of law enforcement. Ari, good to see you, baby girl. Wonderful to have your face. Um, so, um, Samara, Ari, and we got these adults here, and it's, it's wonderful to have them, and we have some folks on Facebook Live uh, as well. And uh, I, will be, uh, I will be recording this um, um, and posting it uh, to our page. But I'm curious, uh, Ari and Samara, as young African-American uh, females, can you share with us, this is just kind of an opening conversation, can you uh, share with us how you're feeling as a young uh, black female in America today? How do, you, how do you feel about what's going on uh, in our world? And if you can add to that, how do you see your future in this, in this world in the context of, of what's going on here? Either one of you can start. I'm, I'm interested in hearing what you have to say. Um, I definitely feel kind of trapped because I get scared now to kind of just like walk, walk to the store to get like candy or soda or anything. Um, I'm definitely scared to like go out more often, I guess, just the fear of being stopped by any type of just crooked police who will potentially, you know, hurt me. Mm. Um, like I, I'm now just it kind of just feels like we're all living in fear I like I'm scared for my cousins brothers friends all of them it's just like me wanting to stay home more often than I normally do because I remember before corona and everything I was always going to practice or going roller skating or just hanging out being a regular teenager now it's like it's really hard to be that to be a regular teenager in America and like in the future um like it's it scares me having to explain to like young kids future nieces and nephews and cousins like what to do when a police stops them or how to act around people like certain people and it just it's just really something that i'd have to prepare myself for and something that i'm gonna have to look forward to mm. can, I, can i ask a, a question about that you know you talk about fear and being afraid can you talk about how that may be affecting you emotionally? I, I mean, you know, you, you, you describe that, you know, going out, being out, and then also having to share uh, with your younger um, relatives. Can you talk about that fear a little bit? Um, I guess it kind of affects me emotionally, mentally. It's just like, it's caused me to be silent more. Like I don't, I'm not talking about how I feel um, with the situation. It's like I lock myself in my room. It's it's like I feel as if if I just step out of the house, it's like my whole life is just at risk. So I try to stay inside more, and I guess that fear is just, it's like kind of just takes over me. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of hard to explain. It's like I just. It's like there's no type of, there's no place that's safe unless I'm like with my family. 
Okay. I already talk, thanks, Amara. I already talk, talk to me about kind of what you're feeling about society. What are you feeling as a young black woman uh, about your future? Talk, talk to me about that. Well, I'll, I feel sad because like, especially in Marietta, because there's like a lot, it's predominantly white and stuff. And so I get judged like way more for like doing anything basically. Like I could just be walking and I'll get judged like at school and stuff and um, in public. It's okay. It's okay. Sorry. Yeah, it's okay, Ari. I, I, I appreciate you sharing sharing that. And you know what what I'm what I'm hearing from you is is pain about being black in America, a black woman, black young girl in America. And so I appreciate you you sharing that. And that and that's really what this platform is for. So there's no embarrassment and there's no judgment uh, from us. We are. Um, you know, we want we want you to express what's what's going on in your heart and what's going on in your mind. And John, just FYI, um, I I have a, a San Diego County um, uh, city manager who's asked to meet next week. And so one of the, I just want everybody to know that one of the things I'm doing is taking notes, not, there's no names attached to these notes, I'm taking notes on issues that um, I can bring up during that meeting uh, with the city manager, because the city manager is trying to wrap his head around um, the feedback that he is getting and that the city council members are getting pertaining to um, how how the in, in this case it's a uh, sheriff's sheriff's contract so how the count, San Diego County sheriffs respond to calls what calls they respond to the level of force they use whether or not this is whether or not the the law enforcement and peacekeeping that they perform in this city um, is uh, is fair is equitable is reasonable is necessary. Um, and so I'm just taking down a few notes. Yeah. I mean, this, for instance, this, this, and I appreciate for instance, one, one of the first notes I'm taking down is that, you know, I was at a, I was at a meeting on Sunday morning, just happened a few minutes ago, where a young black woman, teenager, shares that she feels like her life is at risk when she steps out the door. That's the kind of stuff I'm writing down so that I can share that, that share that perspective that, that maybe policymakers aren't hearing enough. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I think the I think the mental health piece, um, and Patrice, I, I think this was an area that, that you have talked about in the conversation you and I have had. But I think the middle the mental health piece of our African American youth is um, is a is a missing um, conversation. Um, I, I mean, when you hear Samara and you hear Ari. Um, talk about just and these are these are bright um, uh, young people, right? These are these are regular, and they both live in the suburbs. You know, somewhere lives in Riverside, Ari lives in Marietta. You know, Bo's children are in Marietta. I mean, this, this is a, this is not inner city Chicago, Detroit, DC, New York, right? This is this is the burbs, right? And so, if we consider what they are feeling. In this, in the context of where they live, man, imagine what our youth may be feeling in other places. Could you speak a little bit, would you? Uh, absolutely. I just want to uh, definitely tell our young, beautiful uh, young ladies that you are not alone in how you are feeling. And there's no shame in being able to articulate how you're feeling. In fact, we want you to articulate how you're feeling. We want to know these things. And in our African-American community, we have been told to be quiet about it. We have been told 
to um, turn the page. Don't talk about it. To the point now where it's not even turn the page, it's no longer written in the page. So what Dr. Wells is talking about today is our history. And we have a strong, powerful, um, resilient history that's no longer being taught. The idea is um, the moment they can tell us that our story is not important is when we will lose our story, especially Dr. Wells, when we move out of certain communities and plant ourselves in another predominant community that doesn't represent us. When we do that, we really try uh, really hard to assimilate, okay? And there's no such thing as assimilation. You can do your best to put on um, the aspect or the behavior and the culture of somebody else, but it will always be foreign to you. Yeah. Um, so the idea is, even when we get into other communities, we have to somehow um, continue to hold on to our own culture and make it okay. And without the fear of reprisal. One of the worst things that we can do is become afraid and retreat um, inside of our own homes or retreat inside of our own being. Yeah. That means even though I'm out and about, I'm not who I am. And if we don't show uh, who we are, they will label us and then we will conform to whom we will conform to who they say we are. Yeah. And no matter how afraid we um, are, we have to resist. We have to resist uh, withdrawing from the public light. Does that mean we go out at 10 o'clock at night and to places where we know the police are roaming? Absolutely not. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking in our day to day. And I'm older than most of these beautiful young ladies. I remember I used to be your age, but I can tell you even on my job in this counseling field, okay, a lot of African-Americans within the military services do not go to counseling because we're not represented in counseling. And the moment they go to counseling, they're given um, advice from someone who doesn't understand Okay, the culture, yeah. right? Who doesn't understand the culture. Denzel Washington, and then I'm going to pass it on to you, Dr. Will. Denzel Washington had a, a, a great representation of race or culture. And I don't know if our young girls remember getting their hair. I don't, they probably don't do it as much. But on Easter night, the night before Easter, my mom <laughs> would straighten my hair with a hot comb. Yeah. Girls, do y'all still get your hair with a hot comb <laughs> and my mom would put grease on my hair and then she would take the hot comb and it was sizzle. Yeah. And Denzel Washington said, it's not race. Somebody who's Caucasian or Mexican can play that, but when they do the sizzle, they won't understand compared to somebody that's an African American trying to play that role we understand, we actually feel the pain. So right. when I even right. talk about the sizzle, right. Right, I can still feel the pain. So my motion behind that scene is based on culture and not race. Yeah. And that's the part that we don't want to lose. That's good. Thank you, Patrice. I, I want to hear, hear from Pastor Ball, and, and, even, and you can chime in as well. So both Ariana and Samara talked about being fearful in their community, fearful as young women. And that's a really interesting thing that we're not talking about, you know, we have a serial rapist out in the community or someone who's attacking black girl. We're talking about just being black. You add to that being a black woman, right? And then just being a girl, right, in the community. You add all of that, that is a lot of stress, and fear. So 
uh, Bo, you have girls. Uh, uh, Patrice, you have you have girls. Talk to them, and I'm I'm, I'm kind of glad we kind of got this close little group today, right? Um, because I love both of these girls. Uh, of course, Samara's my granddaughter. Ari is, you know, like a daughter. You know, she's a part of our church. And so, talk to them from a father's point of view, Pastor Bo, from a mother's point of view, Sister Patrice, about how do they deal with that fear? How do they overcome uh, that fear of being out and about in the community? What do you tell your daughter? What do you tell Trinity? What what, what do you tell Victoria? What do you tell them? Go ahead, Bo. Well, um, yeah, I have had this conversation, you know, especially with my daughter, uh, still being young. Um, just encourage her and letting her know though, that she is a strong, you know, black young lady. Um, never allow anyone to define who you are. Know who you are within yourself. Um, and and it, it kind of pains me that at this age, that these kids really can't be kids because of how they are afraid of the repercussion that they may have because of the color of their skin. Um, like I tell Trinity and my other daughters, be proud of the skin that you wear. You know, God, God loves us all regardless of our skin. However, there are just some ignorant people in this world that don't understand your culture, that don't understand your race. Um, and I'll be honest with you, uh, Pastor, and I'm, Ariana, I, me right now, I am afraid myself to allow my daughter to go out alone right now. I mean, I, I don't even feel comfortable with that, you know, and, and I feel like I have to be her protector when she can't protect herself and when she's not able to speak up for herself. Um, and, and that's where I'm at as a dad right now, because, you know, as a dad, you know, you always want to protect, especially your young girls, because you don't want anything horrible or anything bad said to them or, or even done to them. Um, and, and it's just, it's a tough time that we live in. And, you know, the question that, you know, I get asked by them is like, why do we have to be talked about? Why do we have to be treated this way because of the color of our skin? And I simply tell them because it's, it's just ignorance, you know, because some people don't want to get, you know, take the time out to get to know who you really are besides the color of your skin. And then a, a lot of those individuals, that's just the way that they're brought up. They don't know any better. Instead of them trying to take the time out to get to know you, take the time out to get to understand who you really are, will they ever really be changed if they don't want to get the knowledge of your culture? Um, but I tell them, you know, don't be afraid, you know, because of the color of your skin, you know, stand up for what you know is right, you know, believe that you are strong, uh, black young lady, you know, and, and it's tough right now, Pastor. Yeah, that's good. That's good. That's good counsel. I appreciate that. Uh, Patrice? I just want to ditto um, what Pastor Bo was saying. I think as the African American community, we need to really, really um, change the message uh, from young children in the African community. Um, we have seen so many negative things that is uh, relegated to us as uh, African Americans. I remember growing up and every other commercial was Africa, children starving, flies on the food. I remember watching the first King Kong where we were considered primitive, you know, ashy looking. I actually did one of my um, senior in my undergrad, I did my senior paper on how uh, Coming to America was the first uh, show that pictured Africa if you remember Eddie Murphy, and it was the, it pictured Africa as a bright, colorful, beautiful women, um, a king, queen, and I actually compared um, that 20 year difference between the first King Kong and coming to America. A lot of our story is told um, where we were just beaten down. And I think as African American, especially adults and parents, we need to go back and uh, trace that that's not where our story began. Our story did not begin 
in slavery. Our story began way, way past there where we had kings and queens and princesses. Um, I mean, we can even go to Egypt, right? I'm in Bahrain. I can get to Egypt and see, you know, Africans built that pyramid, right? Um, so really begin to change the narrative so at a young age so that uh, they began as little ones to take pride in their culture. Now, so, do we teach them about root and queen and all of those? Absolutely. But we teach it to the point of overcoming, of resilience, yeah. you know, doing reconstruction. What did we do? We became teachers and doctors and lawyers. Yeah. We were congressmen. Um, and those things are not taught in our books. I was reading one of my son's history books to him doing homework, and they have now put slavery uh, right next to indentured servitude. So they are trying to rewrite. Slavery was not indentured. We could not buy our way out of uh, slavery very often. Very rarely could we buy our way out. Yeah. So we just need to continue to talk about the resilience of um, the African American and where we came from. Um, and then surround ourselves with african-american people that's so important to me that does not mean we don't socialize with others but well, what's, the benefit of that? what's the benefit of that patrice you talk about the, um uh, building community and and having uh relationships and friends that are african-american what help me to understand help the girls to understand what, what it is that you're saying in that the benefit of that what is that we can see our own prospering. We can see um, what they did. And I remember even reading about Black Wall Street. Do we teach our young people about Black Wall Street when we had a whole area where we bought from our own, we sold to our own, we were taught by our own? And the reason why they got mad wasn't because um, a white and black thing. It was big. we built our own economy. And I think once they destroyed that, we would never ever uh, able to get back to being able um, to keep our wealth within our own community. And I think we are starting to see the, the, the um, atmosphere change where people are starting to try to surround ourselves, but our black boys need to see black men. They need to see black men. Yeah. We got a lot of black women, but we our black boys need to see black men and black men really need to take ownership yeah. of let, our let, young black women. Let me interject that because we live in a we live in a culture, particularly those of us who live in Marietta, where mm -hmm. um, uh, I, hope, I hope this doesn't sound offensive, but I, I wanna be I wanna be straight, where our black boys do not communicate the value of our black girls um you know unless unless like in the boston family where uh, trinity has brothers who love her and protect her and value her we we live in a place where our our white girls go after black boys and our mm -hmm. black boys go after black girls and the black okay. girls are left to kind of like, you know, what's what's wrong with us? And so we've got yeah. that, we've got that thing. And so uh, several things that you said, one relates to education. And Pete, I'm gonna go to you because you're gonna you read the well, um, hang on. I want you I want you to repeat what you just said because I'm not sure you you meant I think I'm not sure you meant what you said. You said you, you said uh, um, go that do, do that again. You're talking about dating or courting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so well, say, say, say that again. Who's going after? Who's who's interested in who? So the black boys are interested in the white and Hispanic girls, right? Oftentimes, mm -hmm. leaving um, an impression upon the black girls that they're not of value, right? Okay. And so, and I'm talking about particularly in this, you know, in this community that we live in. When you talked about assimilation of Patrice that assimilation really doesn't occur. Um, and, and if it does occur, um, the, the black girls feel like they have to whitewash. They have to, they gotta, they've gotta straighten their hair, right? 
Uh, mm -hmm. Like the mm -hmm. white girl, they have to mm -hmm. you know, they have to wear certain things. They have to do certain mm -hmm. things to be noticed, uh, to be mm -hmm. of value, and to be appreciated. Uh, mm -hmm. And so we've got this whole population of African American mm -hmm. female, and that's happening on the adult side as well. But I mean, Samara's fourteen, you ready to turn fifteen? Ariana, how are you? How old are you? 14. 14. Uh, Trinity, mm -hmm. I, I think is 14 or 15. And so, you know, mm -hmm. we've got this, we've got, I think uh, Victoria just turned 15, I believe it is. And so you, we've, got this, we've got these young African-American women who, who are dealing with this issue of esteem of who they are as black women. And you look at mm -hmm. these girls, they're all different. Uh, but they're but they're all beautiful in in their own in their own right. And so we're, it's it's a matter of valuing um, who they are, valuing where they came from. And you you hit it spot on, Patrice. We talk about um, um, uh, royalty in Africa mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. and what that looked like prior to sixteen hundred, um, and then mm -hmm. during that period of time when there was a raping and pillaging of that of that continent and understand it wasn't just raping and pillaging of the human uh capital it was also diamonds and all these other natural gems and resources in africa uh -huh. Uh -huh. so you're uh -huh. right but i think the key when we talk about fear to samara and ari we talk about fear i think the key is to educate you um, mm -hmm. Because with education uh, comes a certain degree of confidence that, mm -hmm. you know, if, if, if I tell you, Samar or Ariana, that when you're out in, when you're out in public, one, um, Bo, you mentioned this, you should have a buddy. You should have a friend. Mm -hmm. You should have mm -hmm. someone that you should be with. You should always be aware of your surroundings. Uh, when you're in a parking lot, you know, don't walk you know, don't walk up to or walk by or park by a, a van, right? That, especially a van that has no window. I mean, it's just, I mean, it's an awareness. And when you have better awareness of your surroundings, you can have a certain degree of confidence and not have to function in fear, right? Uh, I know the law. When a cop gets behind me, yeah, I, I, my, my, the, my, the beat of my heart uh, rate increases just because I know the power and authority uh, that they have, but I also know my rights, right? And so when I when I pull over and I roll down my window, I, you know, I've got my I've got my documents ready because I know that's what he's going to ask for. Um, so my my fear level decreases because I I have information. I know how to talk. I know what my rights are. I know what documents he's going to need. And if it goes sideways, um, I know what to do. And so for you young ladies, it's important that you are educated um, about what your rights are, um, you know, what you should do when you're out in public, um, information and knowledge. And Patricia alluded to this, Boy, you alluded to this, we also need to educate. Um, yes. I don't know when African American studies was taken out of the public schools, if it was ever, um, I don't, I don't remember it in high school. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I remember it in college. I remember it very little. I remember, I remember talking history. about the little passage. Yeah. I remember talking um, about slavery, but it was only one chapter. Right, right. However, now, it's not, e it's not a chapter. I don't even think it's a whole chapter now. And we definitely don't talk about the Middle Passage. Um, but if I could add to what you were saying, one thing that I do recognize um, is we have to teach our children to respect authority. You know? And I am not saying that um, that we cause a lot of this a predicament on ourselves because I hold the police to a high standard. But we have to, uh, where do we get, I could, I had to say yes ma'am, no ma'am, yes sir, no sir, to parents, to any, teachers. Any 
any authority. I was taught any authority, anybody my mama's age or above, um, teachers, principals, next door neighbors. So we need to one, uh, know who we represent. When we walk out the house, who are we representing? And as Christian young women, we represent God first. So if a police is asking us some questions, we're going to ask, answer them politely. Um, but we still go know our rights. Sir, what have I done? I mean, so we don't have to bow down uh, and just take anything. But one thing that I do notice, some of the things that I see is the, 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 the ritual, the, if that's the word I'm trying to say, the, um, that we see some of our uh, young people have towards our um, service mem not our service members, that's my husband, mm -hmm. our police officers. Yeah. We really need to, you know, represent, you know, um, our culture very well. That to the point where um, we ourselves um, don't put ourselves in a, a situation that we can't get ourselves out of. And I really believe in respect of authority and I think that's one piece that the African American community is losing. I'm not gonna say has lost because I know a lot of respectable young adults. Um, but that's something that in the African American community we, we used to have uh, locked down. You, and we, know, and you, have um, to rec you have to recognize that there always are going to be incidences with those who are in authority who will misuse and abuse that authority. So, you know, we can talk about the George Floyd a situation. We can talk about the Absolutely. Artemis situation. And, and those are anomalies, uh, and I always hesitate to use that term um, because they happen too often. And I mean, that's what this whole uprising is about, that what happened with George Floyd um, was something that has happened for decades. This, that was not a new uh, event. I mean, if you if you look at some of the pictures from the 60s, 70s, 50s, that was a common occurrence um, with law enforcement and African Americans. Uh, and so, what Patricia said is, yeah, you you are respectful. And Pete and I have talked about this for several weeks now. You are respectful. You know your rights. You uh, uh, you comply um, at, at at appropriate times. But you also know that that can still go sideways, right? It can still go bad. But the, but the key is, is that you do everything that you're supposed to do and you leave the onus of misbehaving uh, in the hands of the cop, if they're going to act like that. And I'm, and I'm gonna say this to you, 99.9%, .9%, and I'm, 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 I'm gonna preface this, we're talking about individuals on the force. 99% of them are good cops. But we're not just dealing with individuals, individual officers. We're also talking about organizations. Some organizations are bad. And when an organization is bad, they produce a culture even from good cops. Okay? And so you have to differentiate between a bad cop, a bad organization. Um, but what this is really about, ladies, is about you being informed, about you being educated, and about you knowing your history and your culture. And that's, that's one of the things that I'm, I'm hoping uh, to do, because they're not going to operate in school, um, is to provide community uh, awareness academy as relates to African-American history and culture. As a matter of fact, next week is a big week for this conversation. Because I've got Dr. Daniel Walker. Uh, I went to the San Diego State with Daniel. Uh, he's a PhD uh, in African-American studies at UCR, University of California, Riverside. He is going to be joining us next week. And I want to get as many young people on this call as possible next week because he's going to kind of give us an overview. He runs um, the uh, Underground Railroad Tour uh, in the North. Man, I can't wait to do that with him. Um, but he takes us the path that, that uh, Harriet Tubman, uh, Moses took, and um, uh, talks about the, that journey. 
And so that's next week, uh, same bat time, same bat channel. Um, so I appreciate the input that I've gotten from you folks. So look, I just, I'm curious to hear, and we've got a, we've got a small group today and it's fine. I'm curious to hear from Samar, from Ariana, what, what you think is necessary for us to go forward. What, what is, what's necessary for us as a people, black people, to go forward and achieve and succeed? What, what do you think needs to be done from your perspective as 14, soon to be 15 year olds? Tell me, tell me what you think needs to be done and we're taking notes. Any idea? Um, I think we definitely need to start educating ourselves, going back to the roots and the foundation of how everything started, which means going back to slavery and working our way up to when we were freed um, to segregation, to redlining, to police brutality, um, the civil rights movement, all of it. And then also recognizing like with police brutality, how it all started because police were created to capture run runaway slaves. So it's kind of like you, we, educating ourselves is like what I think we really need to do to understand why we are where we are right now and how we can change it. Because if we understand what um, the situation and how what events occurred um, to get where we are, then we could start coming up with solutions and figuring out a way to make it right. And so Mara, what, what do you think, what do you think that education is going to accomplish for you, for your generation? What do you think that's going to accomplish for you? Um, I think that's going to open our eyes more and allow us to become more aware of the situation. And it'll also start our, it'll kind of it's like a jump start for our brains to, um, cause I feel like my generation, we I feel like we have so many creative ideas for the world. Um, I feel like we have a lot of bright minds. We just like, we don't use them because we're scared of judgment or the hard work that's gonna come with it, just the risk. So I feel like if we educate ourselves and um, be open to releasing our ideas, it will just allow us to it will allow us to actually start making some type of change. Okay, okay, that's good. Ari, what do you think, what do you think is um, needed as we go forward, uh, particularly as it relates to your uh, generation? What, what do you think is needed? Ariana? I think we should have like more diverse friend groups and stuff, like for we can all learn from each other. Mm. Um, let, me, let me make sure I understand. So you, you think an opportunity for engagement and interaction cross-culturally um, yeah. and, and learn in a setting where there are multiple cultures being taught about and learned about. Is that right? Yeah. That's, that's, that's good. And uh, I'm going to, I'm going to, chime in here a little bit. I've been, get, I've been picking up on a lot of stuff. Thank you all for sharing because I'm learning and I'm writing and, I'm, and I've got ideas that I can take. First of all, I want to say that when, when you all have an opportunity to speak, speak, because it is powerful. And when you have an opportunity to speak in a setting where policy is discussed and created, speak and I'm talking about classroom school board meetings city council meetings where policy is made um, the police police community relations boards or committees that exist and are going to be expanded they're, they're gonna make they're gonna make more these are these are gonna grow and know that your 14 year old voice needs to be heard okay. in, in that setting. Uh, 
it's powerful. Um, and I had a question actually, I, I got a, a bunch of stuff I'm writing down, but I had a question for Patrice and it relates to, uh, I, I gotta write it down. Um, I'm seeing Alaska Air, Christopher Walsh. Remind me what your first name is? That's Ari. Ari? Ariana. Ariana. Um, Ariana, um, I grew up in that um, environment that you just described. Okay. Back in the, back in the late 60s, we were coming out of the civil rights era, or maybe we were knee deep in it. And um, somebody had the idea that, well, not the idea, schools were segregated. You had black schools and you had white schools. And the idea was to integrate young people. Um, and so that they get to know each other, right? Mm -hmm. And looking back on it, I completely and totally understand that, that I and my parents voluntarily moved to a school district, one of three in the nation in 1969, that were instituting integration, busing. They were gonna bus kids from one part of town to the other part of town in order to get them together. And so I was part of an experiment. Now I talk, now I call it, and I call it the experiment, an experiment. <laughs> And um, uh, I was a guinea pig, right? Um, and um, so, and that, and that school, the schools that I went to were, were petri dishes, where where I don't know who the policymakers were, and I don't know who the decision makers were, and so forth. But they were they were watching us in this petri dish dish interact with each other and get to know each other and learn from each other, and they're figuring out about that. And a question I have for maybe Patrice and Bo and John, since, since they may have, they were maybe around during these experiments or at least aware of these experiments were, I thought it was really successful. <laughs> um, I am the person I am today because, because of that experiment. Um, and yet I also completely and this goes to a number, a number of other questions I have because I'm doing some research right now. And first of all, I wanna know what you guys think about um, Ibram Kendi and, and the work that he's doing right now around anti-racist, the anti, being an anti-racist. But, um, and one of the things you mentioned, uh, Patrice, was um, we have moved away from as much integration, I mean, I look at the numbers statistically, we've moved back towards segregated schools. Mm -hmm. um, at this point, I mean, statistically, if you look at the statistics, mm -hmm. um, and, and I don't, and, and since I had such a positive experience with it, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure about that. And yet I, I read Kendi, I read Ibram, Dr. Kendi, mm -hmm. And I see somebody who's saying, you know what? It's okay for black people to be together, but as a community, that's, your that's, mm -hmm. that's okay. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that came up when you were talking, Patrice, is um, that that threatens the bejeebers mm -hmm. out of um, white people, mm -hmm. some white people, out oh. of, out of, <laughs> out of, some pools of money that threatens right. that that threatens money it threatens power pools of power white pools mm -hmm. of power white pools of mm -hmm. money mm -hmm. and and just the just the idea about black people uh, gathering you know let's not talk about let's not let's even leave tulsa out of it black wall street out of it it's, when it comes to white supremacy or maybe even intrinsic whiteness, when two black people are together, it's like, oh, what are they up to, right? Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then you add five, then you add whole neighborhoods, and mm -hmm. it's scaring the, the heck out of, the, out of this, this, this white power structure, this white money structure that exists, right? Mm -hmm. Thought, thoughts, on anything, thoughts on anything I just said? 
<laughs> well, a, a couple of thoughts. One thought is it was an experiment to, um, to bust our children into not my children, like my mom, <laughs> that age. Hello. Um, right. It was, it was a um, social experiment and I think it was unsuccessful. And the reason why I think it was unsuccessful is because I think it did a lot of psychological damage um, to that African-American student, mm -hmm. um, especially during those early years when literally you had hundreds upon hundreds of uh, people yelling and screaming and spitting at those first few students of color that was integrated into the school where you actually had to have the National Guard to escort children into school. Um, that was psychologically damaging. And you cannot tell me that that wasn't generational when you had children who started to hate school. When education is the pillar of um, uh, the ladder to get out of poverty. So now you're having students in a school where they are not wanted. They're not wanted by the fellow student they're not wanted by the teacher. They're not wanted by the neighborhood. Um, and they are being forced to get to that school every day and try to learn what? Yeah, I mean, it was a, a double-edged sword, Patrice. Right. I, I, I just want to interject here. It was a double-edged sword. It was good and it was bad, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, it, it was good for us, right, today, because Ariana and Samara can go to any school, and as long as they right. live in an area, they can go to any school district, and they can right. get a better education. Whereas before, right. they were stuck in a, a school district, potentially with poor education, uh, right. uh, inferior textbooks, et cetera. So good and bad came out of that. I apologize for interrupting. But the funding, they could have funded the school. So what happened to those African American schools? They had to come back to this huge, ugly building that was now festering with homeless, with drugs, with uh, broken windows. They had to actually go from one white community and then go back and see this in their own community. So how does that African-American child feel about even coming back home when their own community is ugly? When yeah. their own community is now drug infested and you got these pockets of these huge schools that were useless. Now. And also Patrice, they, also yes. Patrice Dr. Kendi, talk, I'm learning a lot right now, but one of the things yes. he's teaching me about is the concept of assimilationist. Right. And, and the potential damage <laughs> that that does to a culture or a people. To, talk about that, Pete. What, describe well, what he yeah. talks about. <laughs> well, well the, 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 he, would, he would argue that the integration experiment um, was an assimilationist experiment where the, I believe where, that. The white, where the white community was attempting to, to assimilate blackness into whiteness. Mm -hmm. what, however you want to describe that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. That's the book. Um, but, I will uh, get that and, this and, evening. And I, and I I'll think get that. And I think people who are, who are thinking about this understand what I mean when I say that. And Patrice, you're nodding your head because you understand what I mean by white I people in, in the 60s were saying to right. themselves, we, we need to get black people to assimilate to our whiteness, right. what, whatever that looks like. White, whatever, white and I, I so agree economics. with that. Yeah. With that? You, you don't I said, I so, uh, I so agree with that statement. Um, yeah. And yeah. the idea is it confused our children to the point of I'm bad, this is good. My community, we don't have it, so now I have to go to the other community. And I remember, even though this was years 
years ago, my high school, we were bus. If I missed that school bus, I literally had to walk about three and a half miles to school. If I missed my school bus in my down the street from my home to get to the other school, it was literally about three and a half, four, four and a half miles uh, away. When in actuality, there was a school right down the street that I could have gone to if they would have funded the school. So now we have something that's called school choice. And I was an educator. I'm now a counselor, but I was an educator. My only thing about school choice is the moment there is another school better than my community school, that's where I am going to go. Maybe. But my money, my tax dollar money goes with me. Okay? What happens to that school where that parent can't get their child to that school in two counties away. What happens to that neighborhood school is it becomes a failing school that the state or the county has to take over and be funded. So now we have children who cannot escape. Now, do I like the idea of my own child going to a school um, that may be failing? Absolutely not. But what I do say is I can go to another school, but my taxpayer dollar stays at that school because that's my community. That way that school is not just, now what happens when you take the school, the money away? Teachers leave. But his good teachers are going to go to where the dollars are, and those are in the community schools. That's number one. So now I have teachers who are straight out of school that this is their first teaching job, and they're looking for their first opportunity out. So I am for uh, choosing the school that you want to go to, but I believe your tax dollars should stay in your community. That way, even though you're gone, that school is still being funded so it can have updated books so it can pay their teachers what they are deserved because we want the good teachers to stay in our communities of any any community you want and the good teachers bear with me on the next question and that is it's okay for black people to be with black people in a black community right that's okay of course absolutely of course it's okay absolutely right? We have just okay. been conditioned. I think it's a condition. I remember when I was little, that's what we did. I mean, the black community was the black community. Everybody on our block well, knew well, what, who everybody was. But what was the problem? The, the problem was economics. When they, when they put black people in black communities, they were the black people that were in that community were blue collar workers, they were underpaid, they lived in, in, in uh, dilapidated um, uh, buildings that weren't being kept up, and so they became mm -hmm. ghettos. And so now we live in 2020 where success for the black man is to do what? Get out of the community leave the community in which right. they may have grown up in. And so we come to Marietta and Temecula, and we don't go to black churches, right? We go to right. churches that are more assimilated, right? That yep. are more diverse. Yep. Well, is there yep. some positivity in that? Yep. Well, sure yep. there is. And then, let's, and then there's all kinds of layers, but then there's the law enforcement layer. Yes. And then, and then how does modern policing, and I loved uh, Samara, I loved your uh, mm -hmm. description of historically where where law enforcement, ha, ha, uh, what law enforcement was charged with by the powers that by, by the white powers that be, and what they were asked to do over throughout history. And there's a lot of history on law enforcement and 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 what government has asked them to do. That, that's wonderful that you're looking into that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, but another question is, okay, so, so if it's okay, and I also believe it's okay for black, you know, if black people want to be with black people in black community, that's, that's absolutely fine. Mm -hmm. And, and, um, 
and I'm okay with that. And, and, and if, F, if black people want to, I think they should live where they want to live, just like everybody Absolutely. else. In this world. They should have a choice Absolutely. to live where they want to live, wherever right. that is. Uh, and not held back. They should be treated equally, just like everybody else. But then how do we then uh, create a law enforcement agency that is able to responsibly provide services for that black community or black neighborhood? Because re regardless of this conversation we're having, there are communities of color that exist. And I think if you, I think if we're honest about it, we understand how, how those community uh, communities of color and in particular black communities were created very intentionally at times by the, uh, by the uh, white population. Um, but then, but then the, one, of the, one of the very serious conversations we need to have and continue to have, we've been having this for some time, mm -hmm. is how do we then responsibly provide law enforcement services for those communities? This goes back to another comment that was made earlier. Um, uh, John, I think you were talking about um, law enforcement and the fact that there were individuals that were doing the wrong thing. There were entire cultures, uh, like entire agencies that were potentially doing the wrong thing. But then I, I want to take it to the next level and say that we got to look at this from a policy perspective. What are the, what are the, the guidelines that, that police employees are given? What are the policies and procedures that exist, mm. including very, very importantly, the use of force policy and procedure? and the training associated with use of force. But how about the laws too? Let's take it to the next level. What's going on in, in Sacramento at your, at your local, at your municipal uh, um, city hall, at, at the county board of supervisors, at the state legislature, and back in Washington, mm -hmm. what, what laws are being written? Why are they being written? And how are they being enforced? These are multiple layers when it comes to law enforcement and policing. Uh, I, I'm, I'm going to use the facilities. I'll be right back. So hold your thoughts. Yeah. So, <laughs> so listen, the, the goal of this conversation, um, one is, is to have that first conversation. Um, Samara, Ariana, um, and anyone else that's listening, any young person that's listening, I, I want you to know um, how important your voice is. Um, Pete said it, um, but I, I can't stress it any anymore. Uh, Pastor Ball, Sister Patrice, um, Pete, myself, we are not the generation that's going to bring the change. No. We are, we are not that generation. We, we can speak and we can encourage, but I feel it is our assignment to empower you and to encourage you. Absolutely. You are the generation that I believe. I, I, I think uh, Generation Z, where your, your, your peers are more open to um, understanding differences um, and likenesses and appreciate those differences than any mm -hmm. generation before them, right? Mm -hmm. And so, Pete said this, and I want to remind you of this as we kind of draw the conversation to a close. One is you have to care enough about this time. You have to care enough about this issue. You have to care enough about not only yourselves, but um, 10 years from now, you're going to be um, seniors, juniors, seniors, and maybe even uh, graduates of college, right? Um, uh, maybe you may go to an HBCU, maybe you'll go to SC, Harvard, wherever, um, but you have a responsibility to prepare yourself now to make, uh, to, to make a change, to, to mm -hmm. educate yourself, to be informed. Um, mm -hmm. you, you have a responsibility to speak truth, speak your truth to power in your, mm -hmm. he said it, in your classroom. Um, mm -hmm. And even, listen, even to your peers, don't Absolutely. allow people to say ignorant things. Um, don't let it go. 
You don't have to be mean. You don't have to get nasty. Mm-hmm. But but you mm-hmm. can correct. You can politely mm-hmm. correct ignorance, right? Mm-hmm. And that may even mm-hmm. come from girls who look like you, or maybe mm-hmm. it may come from those who don't look like you. But mm-hmm. but you have a response. Both of you are 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 top notch students. I know that. Um, and, and I know you're smart enough to know when to speak, when not to speak. You can, you, you, you can, you speak intelligibly. Uh, 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 you're good students um, and you're athletes and you are going to be given a platform, but you also have to seek the platform. I want to, I want to encourage you to insert yourself. I'm, there's two words there. Insert yourself and assert yourself. Insert yourself in places where you can speak. Well, to do that, you've got to educate yourself, but then you have to insert yourself, serve on student council, uh, be a part of the student advisory council for the school. Um, uh, uh, the school districts have student advisors. Be, Decide right now, both of you all are, are going into high school um, and this is the time, this is the time. Be involved, go to the, to the school board uh, meetings, know what they're talking about. Um, and then lastly, and I've said this to every group, I think every week, um, I wanna encourage you to be a change agent. Um, what does that mean? Well, I want you to look it up. I want you to study that. I want you to do some research. But I'll give you a brief summary. Um, To be a change agent is someone who is aware of the the current state of affairs and that those affairs are either biased, discriminatory, or prejudiced, and they need to change. And that you insert yourself to be an agent for that change. You stand up for the disenfranchised, you stand up for the discriminate, those who are discriminated, you stand up for women's rights, you stand up for the rights of African Americans, you stand up for students, you, you, you have a voice. And I want you to learn to use it. Samar, I've, listened, I've read and heard you give speeches, just powerful stuff. You have a voice and I am expecting you to use those mm-hmm. voices in the circles yeah. that you're in yeah. and in places that you insert yourself. Okay? Bo, Patrice, Pete, I want you to give a like word to these two young women um, and encourage them as we move toward closure of this conversation. Patrice, I would like to say, uh, uh, oh, Bo, we'll start with you. All right, go. Uh-huh. go, go. I'm all, I've always been taught, you know, and I teach especially a lot of young people, knowledge is power. The more knowledgeable you are, the more power that you have. So in, the more you know, the more power you can assert and, and, and use to your benefit. So learn as much as you can about your history. Learn as much as you can about everything that's going on right now so that you can empower yourself instead of waiting on someone to give you power. Excellent. Thank you, Bo. Knowledge is power. Absolutely. I was talking to our youth here. Um, I'm the director of the base youth out here, Dr. Wells. So I've been able to talk to all of the youth here on NSA Bahrain. I meet with them every Wednesday. The last discussion that I had with them was, what are you doing with your awake hours? Mm. That's what's going to set you apart from good to great. So when you are awake, and I sat down with my children, and I said, okay, you wake up at 7.30. You don't go back to sleep until 9.30, 10 o'clock that night. That's 14 hours. That's 13 and a half, 14. What have you done within those hours to advance your future? And the idea is that's what's going to tell you where your future is going to, to lie. Is it spent doing something that's not making you smarter? If this summer, um, uh, if this last school year you got to be, your next expectation should be I'm going to get an A, okay? So in my wake hours, 
you need to actually write down hour for hour what you want to accomplish. Now, girls, we're going to put fun in there, right? We're going to definitely have fun. We're going to take a portion of our day, and it's going to be me time. It's going to be me and friend time. Uh, it's going to be self-care time. But the other hour should be spent advancing your knowledge so you'll be able to sit at a table and discuss things. The problem is when you are in a conversation and can't speak on it intellectually. That's the biggest problem. And that's when you see people go off the, the, the deep end because now they realize they have been beaten intellectually. You should be able to speak on the subjects that we are talking about. So if you need more knowledge about what is really going on, open a book. I told my kids, uh, it was a quote that I hate. It was like, if you ever want to keep knowledge from the African American, they said, put it in a book. Because they know that we may not pick that book up. But we should be picking up books. We should be picking up magazines. I watch CNN, MSNBC, Fox News. We listen to uh, every type of news because I want a balance. I want to hear what everybody is saying. Then I want to take what I know and then apply it to what they're saying. Because the truth be told, out of all of those things, the truth is somewhere in the middle. And if you don't know those things, then you're not going to be able to be in the discussion. I think Pastor Bo said that. I know Dr. Wells said that. We need you on those school councils. We need you at those board, those school board meetings. And you need to say, the next school board meeting, I need to tell you, school board, how as a child I'm feeling. How as a child I'm feeling. And you, 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 you need to make sure you're on the track team, you're on the basketball team, do that. But then also put yourself uh, on those debate teams where you can learn, okay, and put yourself on those student councils. And if you see something that's missing, you start your own. Mm, you start your good. own group. You bring it to the, the school and you say, well, this population is missing. And if you haven't, and Dr. Wells, if this is not appropriate, just tell me. If you haven't watched the Michelle Obama's um, documentary called Becoming, I think as African-American women, we need to see that. She talks about a lot of things that we have talked about today that she lived. Moving to a white neighborhood, she showed her first grade classroom or her second grade classroom that was nice and mixed. By the time she graduated, it was all black. And that's because the African-Americans began, like Dr. Wells said, they began to move in. And by the time she graduated, all the Caucasians had moved out. Gentrification. Okay. And then the teachers that were there told Michelle Obama, you can't go to Princeton. Your brother did, but you can't go. Okay. That's why I say you need to surround yourself with people who will feed into your life. Don't let them box you in. Don't let them put you on a track that you're not comfortable with. I told my children, I'm their guidance counselor. The youth at my church, I'm their guidance counselor. We're going to make sure you're mapped out yeah. to get you to the college, not to the trade, unless that's what the Lord is saying. But we're going to try to map you for the best success. That's why I say we need to make sure we are surrounded with people that's going to speak into your beautiful lives and let you know that you can become anything that you decide that you want based on what you do in your wake hours. And ladies, I will tell you that I'm going to be done. I will tell you, I need you to take tomorrow and start thinking about what did I do yesterday? What have I done that's going to help me to succeed next year in school? What have I done? And if you can't figure out something, then the next day you need to change and say, I'm going to add a new hour of reading. I'm going to add another hour for my math. 
And then you keep adding until you realize your wake hours are productive. This summer, make your awake hours productive. Um, and that's my advice to you. Don't let nobody put you in a box. But at the same time, Dr. Wells said it. I said it to our children who were uh, moving back to the state. I expect, and I can't say this to y'all because I'm this is my first time meeting you all. <laughs> but Dr. Wells said it. He said he expect greatness from you. And as your African-American sister in another country, I say it to everybody, I expect you to be great. And don't allow anybody to tell you that you are not great. You are great. You just have to know it. You have to own your greatness. And if you don't, other people will tell you you're okay. And then you'll live an okay life. But if you know you're great and you start putting greatness into your awake days, your awake hours, then you'll, you'll make it. You'll be very successful. Keep God first, number one. Keep God first. He's always first. But then you do your part. I'm yeah. done. I could talk for another hour. <laughs> I love my young people. I love my And I could listen for another hour, by yeah. the way. And, um, and uh, I was listening as well because I was thinking about what I do, do during my waking hours and I've, I've recorded this and I'm going to play it every morning, what you just said, so that it's a reminder for me to let's get this day together. That, those were great, solid words. Absolutely. It starts uh, here first, right? Girl, girl, <laughs> girls, if you have not um, written this down and if it is not on your uh, screensaver or whatever, um, it's from a book from 1949. And it says, who controls the past controls the future. Who controls the past controls the future. And we're talking about history. Who controls the history, who writes the history, controls the future. And who controls the present controls the past. Uh, so who controls the present controls the history. You need to write that down, you need to remember it, you need to learn it, and you need to make sure that you stay cognizant of that. And you need, you need to be the ones that are controlling the present and therefore controlling the past and therefore controlling the future. Yeah. You all do. Man, that's so good. Um, and and um, these books didn't exist when I was your age. If they had, I wish somebody had handed them to me, but get these books and I recommend that you read this one first, stamped from the beginning, The Definitive History of Racist Ideas in America. Because I, I wasn't only interested in African-American history, I was interested in African-American history as it relates to this, this topic of racism. And it's by Kendi, K-E-N-D-I, Dr. Kendi, so read this one first. Oh, no. So read that one first and no. then read this one second. It's also by Kendi, How to Be an Anti-Racist. I, I finished, unfortunately, I read this one first. I wish I had read this one first because I needed the historical context for this one, but, there, but it's gonna still work for me. I'll be able to relate back and forth and I'm reading back and forth. But um, those two books, um, because in order to, uh, if in the present I'm going to control the past, I need to know what happened. I need to know what happened, and y'all need to know what happened too. Yeah, I'm uh, excited. I'm excited about that. Thank you, Pete. Thank you, yeah. Patrice. Thank you, Bo. Thank you, Samara and Ariana. Um, next week is an important session uh, with Dr. Daniel Walker, um, professor of PhD in African American Studies at University of California, Riverside. Uh, he's a personal friend. We went to San Diego State together. And I'm going to ask Dr. Walker for a reading list uh, because um, you ladies and parents as well, you need to know what are they reading? What are they reading in college? I'll never forget Dr. Danny Scarborough at San Diego State University who opened my eyes 
to racism. I had not experienced it in Los Angeles. Uh, LAPD, I never had any engagement and interaction with the Los Angeles Police Department in Los Angeles in the mid 70s. I came to LA in 1973, went through middle school and high school there, and then I left. I did not experience racism until I came to San Diego in 1978, um, sitting on a bus stop with a, 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 a box of McDonald's fries thrown at me and called a nigger. Uh, by a group of white boys in a pickup truck. I was stunned. But on the campus of San Diego State at that time, 30,000 enrolled students, 500 African American, do the math, okay? Um, so it, it was an education to be on the San Diego State campus and learn about these things. You know, I learned about uh, uh, Toni Morrison, I learned about um, um, oh my God, um, James Baldwin. I, I learned about uh, Langston Hughes. I, I learned about these folks and you need to know them. On my Kindle, I mean, I've got books and books and books and books and books, right? And so you, you have to read, you have to read, you have to be educated, you have to be informed. Both of you ladies, you will go to college, uh, you will go to the best universities. You will you will graduate with honors. You will go and receive your master's degrees. Uh, you will be woke. You will be aware. You will you will go and get your PhDs or your doctorate. You will be the head of companies. You will make a change. Um, I demand it from Samara. It absolutely will happen for Samara. I don't know how. I don't have, I ain't got two nickels to run to get to run together, but we're gonna figure out how she's gonna get into either SC, into Harvard, or into Howard, one of those three uh, schools. Um, it will happen. Both of you ladies are highly intelligent. You are A students, you are athletes. Uh, Ari, I think your sport is softball, is that right? Yeah, yeah, she's a softball player. Sabara is a track uh, runner. Right? AJ, is that you, AJ? Hey, boy. <laughs> Patricia, remember AJ? Kim, uh, Kim Robinson's grandson? Boy, it's good to see your big old head. <laughs> <laughs> so smart, such a smart boy. Um, and so today we are gonna close out. Thank you uh, for being with us. Thank you for the conversation. Patrice, you gave me a gift today. Thank you for being here. I know it's late there. What is it? Um, is it 11 o'clock there? It's, uh, it's just a little bit after nine. It's about oh, nine, 9 30. 9 at 9. Okay. Well, thank you for being with us. No, thank you. Um, I will be here next week. Don't let me forget, please. I will not. If you have a flyer, I will try to um, get some more of our youth. We usually meet on Wednesdays. Okay. But if you can put something together for me, I'll send it out to the parents um, where maybe we can have some of our youth join. Yeah, it'll be on my page. I'll create it and it'll okay. be on my page and you can grab it. Okay. Um, but I just want to okay. thank you all for being here. And um, uh, thank you, Pete, for your insight. Thank you, uh, Pastor Ball, for being available. And of course, ladies, uh, thank you for joining us today. Um, next week, same bat time, same bat channel. We'll see you next week. Bless you guys. Mm -hmm.